Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, or at least I can. Yeah, yes. the volume's good. You can hear me. There's something going on with my camera, and so for whatever reason, it's not on. Um, I've, I've called for help, but for right now, we can go for it with the meeting. You just won't be able to see me. Is everybody okay with that? Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. Um, can someone say something? I'm not sure I can hear you. Testing one, two, three, four. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Because it's uh, well, it's just one minute after twelve. But I do. I don't want to um, to be late getting started. And it looks like we have a forum here. We do. Okay, with that, why don't we go ahead and get started and hopefully my camera issues will be resolved shortly. Um, the time is now 12.02 and I will call the, me the meeting of the District of Columbia Board of Ethics and Government Accountability to order. My name is Norma Hutchison and I'm the Baker Chairperson. This meeting is being held uh, virtually via WebEx and joining me today for this meeting are board members Charles Nottingham, Felice Smith, Darren Sobin, and Melissa Tucker. And together we constitute a quorum for this meeting. Since it was first published, the meeting agenda has not been changed in any way, but I'd ask that you take a moment to review the agenda and then we, if we could have a motion to adopt the agenda, please. So moved. Second. Perfect. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the agenda for today's meeting. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Nays. Hearing none, the board has adopted the agenda for today's meeting. And before us today, the first thing is um, the draft meeting minutes from the March 2nd, 2023 meeting of this board. And will a member make a motion that we consider the approval of the meeting minutes? I'll offer the motion that we approve the meeting minutes from the uh, last meeting in March. Is there a second? A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that the board consider the approval of the March 2nd, 2023 meeting minutes. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any nays? Hearing uh, the chair, Madam, Madam Chair, this is Darren. Darren yes. Sobin. Um, I'm I'm going to recuse from this vote only because I was regrettably unable to attend the last meeting due to other work commitments, and so I wasn't there. Um, but I have reviewed the uh, the minutes. Um, so, but but I'm not going to vote on whether or not they're accurate. <laughs> Any, are there any nays? Okay, well, then hearing none, we've adopted the minutes from March, 20, March 2nd, 2023. Uh, the first item, um, next item on the um, meeting agenda is a report from the Office of Open Government. Director Nikel Allen will provide um, the report on behalf of the office, and she is appearing virtually via WebEx. Director Allen, please proceed. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairperson Hutchinson and members of the board. I am Nikel Allen, Director of Open Government, and I am pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Open Government. Since the last board meeting, OOG has continued to fulfill its meeting, its mission of ensuring that all persons receive full and complete information regarding the affairs of the District of Columbia government and the actions of those who represent them. I'll start my report with Open Meetings Act and Freedom of Information and Act advice rendered by the office. The first item is advisory opinions and formal legal advice. First, the office offered legal advice on the use of personal cell phones to conduct government business. On March 29, 2022, in response to an inquiry 
of whether members of a public body should use personal cell phones to conduct government business, I provided le legal written advice through counsel on the issue. I advise that a public body or its agent that conducts government business via text or similar electronic method under the scope of employment creates a public record under the DC Freedom of Information Act. Such texts meet the definition of public records even if the storage device is privately owned. The term public record applies where the content is merely prepared or used by a public body. The means of storage is immaterial. Government personnel cannot evade DC FOIA by simply preparing records on media that they own. I reiterated the advice stated in the March 16, 2022 advisory opinion number OOG-2022-001 regarding the applicability of DC FOIA to text messaging. On the next item, it is an advisory opinion regarding the Stabilization and Reform Board of Commissioners or STAR Board. On March 21st, 2023, I resolved complaint number OOG-2023-001M, 2023 finding that the STAR Board properly used Open Meetings Act citation to enter a, into a closed session of a meeting to train and develop its public body members and staff, while also finding that the STAR Board violated the OMA's notice of meetings requirement because it failed to provide the public proper notice after unreasonable delay to obtain a quorum which was about an hour. I strongly recommended that the STAR Board schedule both OMA and parliamentary procedure training with OOG. This was based upon receipt on February 9, 2023 of the Open Meetings Act complaint alleging that the STAR Board's then upcoming public body meeting scheduled for February 13, 2023 violated the Open Meetings Act alleging the STAR Board's justification for entering a closed meeting was improper based on the agenda, asserting that the scheduled closed meeting was not to train and develop public body members and staff, but was rather for a policy briefing and discussion. After OOG conducted an investigation, I found that the STAR Board 1 cited the proper justification for entering into a closed session of a meeting to train and develop public body members and staff on its February 13, 2023 meeting agenda, and secondly, that the STAR Board violated the notice meeting provisions of the OMA by depriving the public of meaningful notice when it delayed the start of a meeting for approximately one hour awaiting a quorum to transact official business. Um, so we further said that the proper action would have been to adjourn and then to come back on the record um, once they were able to get a quorum. And the next item is advisory opinion on whether an entity is a public body subject to the Open Meetings Act. On March 30th, 2023, I issued advisory opinion number OOG-2023-0002-M in response to an inquiry from the public body's agency contact about whether the entity was a public body subject to the Open Meetings Act. I found that the entity falls within the similar entity category of the Open Meetings Act definition of the public body and its scope and purpose constitute public business under the Open Meetings Act. The OMA's leg legislative history also clarifies that the DC Council's intent that the statute should cover any other entity that is created by or exercises authority delegated by the District of Columbia government. The entity is in the similar ent entity category as supported by the DC Council's intent expressed in the legislative history. Therefore, this public body's meetings are subject to the Open Meetings Act. Um, the next item of advice is parliamentary procedure advice. On April 4th, 2023, OOG responded to a public body's request for advice on a parliamentary procedure issue. We sent an advisory memorandum um, through council pursuant to 3 DCMR section 10408.2 to point the body to the relevant provisions of Robert's Rules of Order. We advise that even when a member brings back a seemingly identical motion at a later meeting, it is nevertheless a new motion and thus requires no special treatment or supermajority if there has been an intervening passage of time or change in circumstances so the group is actually voting in a different context or with a different information available to them. In general, OOG's regulations provide, I quote, a public body shall be clear and simple in its procedures and invoking finer points of parliamentary procedure 
when doing so would obscure the issues and confuse the public. And that's in 3 DCMR section 10408.1. But here it appeared that even under the strictest, strictest adherence to parliamentary procedure, the public body had multiple routes by which to call up and consider the proposed motion. Um, the next item in my report are informal Open Meetings Act and Freedom of Information Act advice. Since the last board meeting, OOG has responded informally via email or telephone to requests for assistance as follows. We responded to four requests for Open Meetings Act advice, seven requests for FOIA advice, and four requests for technical assistance with open-dc.gov. Remote meeting monitoring. OOG attorneys attend remote public meetings to ensure compliance with the Open Meetings Act and to inspect public body websites and OOG central meeting calendar for public meeting notices and records. We provide legal advice on Open Meetings Act compliance and take action, corrective action if necessary. During March 2023, OOG's legal staff attended 43 remote public body meetings. As a result of the monitoring, 13 instances of written corrective measures were taken. Among other things, the public bodies failed to post agendas that included the Open Meetings Act regulatory statement at the bottom of the agenda and failed to properly cite the proper statutory provision for closure of part of a meeting. OOG provided advice and correction on these legal issues. First, the OMA requires each meeting notice to include the date, time, location, and planned agenda that the public body will cover at the meeting pursuant to DC Official Code Section 2-5765 and two, pursuant to three DCMR 10409.2, public bodies must post the OMA regulatory statement at the bottom of the meeting agenda. And that's, I quote, this meeting is governed by the Open Meetings Act. Please address any questions or complaints arising under this meeting to the Office of Open Government at opengovoffice at dc.gov on all draft and final email agendas. Um, the next item are our training and outreach efforts. So with respect to training and outreach events attended by OOG staff, um, the first is the Office of the Attorney General OOG, OAG Training on Rulemaking 101. On March 1st, 2023, myself, Chief Counsel Barton, and the legal staff attended the virtual course Rulemaking 101 presented by the Office of the Attorney General, which provided an overview of the rulemaking process in the District of Columbia and insights into best practices for drafting rules, as well as an example of right and wrong ways to draft different rules using our local drafting conventions. Director, um, the I'm, next I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, who, who taught that class? I'm just curious, because I used to teach that one. <laughs> um, if anyone can, I don't remember if anyone um, who's from OG staff or well, I think OGE tended as well. Um, it was it was one of our more senior OAG attorneys, which um, I, I can't remember the name, that's but okay. I will. I was just curious. That's no problem. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. It's, uh, it's a month that's passed by. If you'd asked me right after, <laughs> I would know. Um, the next matter is uh, Staley versus Bowser and the District of Columbia. Um, on March 7th, 2023, Chief Counsel Barton and I, along with the legal staff, virtually observed oral arguments before the District of Columbia um, Court of Appeals in Staley versus Bowser, Bowser in the district, a case that involves the Sunshine Act, which I will discuss with other pending legend, uh, litigation, excuse me, momentarily. Um, the next item is recent FOIA decisions by the American Society of Access Professionals, or ASAP, on March 14th, 2023, myself, Chief Council Barton and the legal staff attended the recent FOIA decisions briefings presented by the American Society of Access Professionals. This briefing covered several procedural issues as well as specific decisions impacting federal FOIA exemptions number four through seven. The training was very useful and, and very current. Um, Open Government Coalition Sunshine Week Summit on March 15th. 2023, Board Chairperson Hutcherson and I spoke and answered questions as a panel for the Open Government Coalition Sunshine Week Summit, which was held in person at the OpenGov Hub space. 
We discussed specific items from the board's best practices report, discussing, among other things, the possibility of bringing ANC's advisory neighborhood commissioners under the Open Meetings Act and permanent legislation mandating retention of electronic messages by government employees. Additionally, there was a discussion of possibly a engaging a task force to consider reforms to both the FOIA laws and Open Meetings Act. The event was well attended and the response has been positive. I will also note that board member Tucker was also present and we appreciate her support. Uh, Mayor DC Council breakfast on March 22nd, 2023, I attended the breakfast meeting between Mayor Bowser and the District of Columbia Council where the mayor presented her fiscal year 24 budget proposal that included an overview of her budgetary priorities. Um, the next item is Mayor Bowser's get together with women leaders. On March 27th, 2023, Mayor Bowser hosted a gathering of the District of Columbia government's women leaders. The event was held at the Washington Convention Center and Director Cooks and I attended. The mayor introduced her new chief of staff, Lindsay Parker at the event and they both made remarks. And the next item is meeting with the Detroit City Board of Ethics. On March 29th, 2023, I attended a meeting at Vegas offices hosted by Director Cooks and Supervisory Attorney Stuart Mitchell with the Executive Director of the City of Detroit Board of Ethics, Crystal Phillips. Executive Director Phillips thought to learn about Vegas operations and share ideas about the offices. National Institute of Trial Advocacy webinar. On March 30th, 2023, myself, Chief Counsel Barton, and the legal staff attended the webinar, Direct Examination, Being the Guide for Your Jury, presented by NIDA. This webinar discussed the complexity and impact of direct examination and showed how to use direct uh, examination to guide a fact finder through a narrative by using structure, verbiage, visual aids, and other elements. Um, the next item is Vega Ad Advice Tracker, Questions and Answers. On March 31st, 2023, the legal staff attended the staff training, Vega Advice Tracker Questions and Answers, which introduced the staff to the new inquiries tracking software for both offices. Um, next is how to structure a winning argument for fiscal year 23 presented by the Office of the Attorney General. On April 5th, 2023, the OOG legal staff and I attended this training uh, presented by the Office of the Attorney General and it was basically a training on writing and how to structure your writing um, to have a, a winning argument. But it also applied to this office because it showed how to structure an advisory opinion in a way that makes the best argument. A webinars conducted by OOG staff is next. First is Open Meetings Act training for local school advisory team or LSATs. On March 8th, March 22nd, and March 25th, attorneys Cherie DeBerry, Nicholas Weil, and Anthony Skirbo presented trainings to members of the DC local school advisory team community covering the requirements of the Open Meetings Act as they apply to LSATs, as well as suggested best practices for maximal compliance. In addition, during the March 22nd training, attorney Weil presented additional information on parliamentary procedure. The recordings of all these trainings are posted on the DC Office of Open Government's YouTube channel. The next is Open Meeting Act training. On March 22nd, Attorney DeBerry presented a training on the Open Meetings Act with the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board covering the requirements and best practices for the OMA. And as you may recall, um, we suggested that the ABC Board have this training after their last uh, advisory opinion um, that we issued regarding one of their meetings um, concerning a closed session. Uh, FOIA training on March 23rd, 2023, Attorney DeBerry also presented a training on FOIA 101 to the Office of Risk Management covering the requirements for best practices for the DC Freedom of Information Act. She was supported by members of OOG's legal staff who were present to answer questions. Um, FOIA training, again, on March 28th, 2023, Attorney DeBerry presented a second training on FOIA 101 to the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board covering the requirements for best practices of DC FOIA, and she was again supported by members of OOG's legal staff. OMA training on March 30th, 2023, Attorney DeBerry presented a training on the Open Meetings Act to the Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection Occupational and Professional Licensing staff covering the requirements and best practices of the Open Meetings Act. She was uh, supported by Attorney Skirbo, 
who assisted her with questions and answers. The webinar is now posted on our YouTube channel. Um, OMA training on April 4th, 2023, Chief Counsel Barton presented a training on the OMA to the Automatic Traffic Enforcement Equity and Safety Tra Task Force. Um, the next section of my report is the litigation and legislative update. Um, I'll start with litigation, um, Staley versus Bowser, um, which is the case I mentioned earlier in which three residents of Brentwood seek to enjoin on mostly environmental grounds the construction of a school bus terminal at Montana Avenue and W Street Northeast. OOG listened to the oral arguments before the D.C. Court of Appeals. The plaintiff appellant's attorney, Johnny Barnes, made a brief mention of the legislation that would become D.C.'s Private Enforcement Sunshine Law, Section 742 of the Home Rule Act, which is codified at D.C. Official Code Section 1-207.42. The sunshine language was introduced in the Committee of the Whole of the U.S. House of Representatives on October 10, 1973. The District of Columbia Code annotated lists only four published opinions that arguably construe the sunshine provision. The rarity of this litigation is evidence of the valuable benefit of OOG's administrative complaint procedure and our trainings and other communications with the public, which likely divert some complainants away from the extent of the complexity of a lawsuit. The congressional re record accepted in the appellant's brief is in Dropbox. And you can watch Mr. Barnes' comment and oral argument on YouTube, and we provided the site for you. Um, the next case is Washington Post lawsuit regarding the records arising out of the Capitol insurrection, which is case number 2021-CA-002114B 002114B in D.C. Superior Court. As I have reported, the Washington Post legal entity seeks certain records relating to the Capitol insurrection, including the mayor's WhatsApp messages. The district has filed the supplemental motion for summary judgment as to the remaining claim on March 17th. The motion sets out the details of the record search of the mayor's phone. The motion and appendix are in Dropbox. Mediation remains set for July 26, 2023. Um, the next case is Campaign Legal Center versus Department of Justice regarding records surrounding citizenship questions on the 2020 census. Um, this case is about the 2020 census questionnaire, and it remains in the motions phase in the U.S. District Court on remand. OOG staff will continue to monitor these cases. Um, the next item in my report are legislative matters. Um, the first is a budget oversight hearing before the D.C. Council Committee on Executive Administration and Labor. On March 28, 2023, I, along with Board Chair Hutchison and Director Cooks, testified at the Vega Budget Oversight Hearing before the Committee on Executive Administration and Labor, chaired by Council Member Anita Bonds. And we appeared in person and we provided a comprehensive overview of our present budget, discussed the currently proposed budget, and made specific recommendations and requests for the next fiscal year. And I also answered questions from the chairperson. I also advocated for the inclusion of a legislation of legislation proposed by the DC Office of excuse me the DC Open Government Coalition in the FY24 Budget Support Act and that legislation is the legislation I mentioned in the performance hearing I'm looking to create a task force or commission to review open government issues. Um, the next matter is resolution disapproving the D.C. Council's adoption of the Comprehensive Policing and Justice Reform Amendment Act of 2022 and the Revised Criminal Code of Act of 2022 and Congress joint resolution nullifying the Revised Criminal Code Act of 2022 was signed into law on to March 20th, 2023. The House has also proposed a joint resolution of disapproval of the Comprehensive Policing and Justice Reform Amendment Act, which was introduced and referred to the committee on March 9th. The DC Open Coalition's blog post on this disapproval resolution is in Dropbox. And as you may recall, both pieces of legislation covered open government issues. The Social Security and Transparency Amendment Act of 2023, Bill 25-0170 on February 23rd, 2023, Nine members of the D.C. Council introduced the School Security and Transparency Amendment Act of 2023 
which would exempt from the Open Meetings Act certain briefings on the security of the District of Columbia public schools and parks and recreation facilities. Covered briefings would include those one called by the chairperson of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services in which two, the Department of General Services presents work order and data regarding deficiencies in exterior doors or windows or doors to instructional and regular, regularly used administrative spaces, public address systems, fire alarms or security surveillance system. The Committee on Facilities and Family Services will hold a hearing on this bill on April 13th, 2023 at noon. Comments are due on April 20th, 2023. The introduced bill and the hearing notice are in Dropbox. Um, OOG has not determined whether we will comment or not yet. Fidelity and access to government communications clarification, emergency temporary amendment acts of 2023, bills 25-0165 and 25-0166. Like the similar temporary provision from the last council period, these measures would clarify that communications created or received electronically in the course of official business are subject to the District of Columbia Public Records Management Act of 1985. As with the last council period, the mayor let the bill take effect without her signature, and it is now DC Act 25-56. A, a companion temporary version passed on first reading on March 7, 2023, and passed this week on April 4, 2023, after final reading. The signed Emergency Act and the engrossed temporary bill are in Dropbox. Medical Examiner Records Privacy Amendment Act of 2022, DC Law 24-241. This legislation, which covers the content of autopsies and external medical examinations of decedents, such as photographs, and excludes them from treatment as public records for FOIA purposes, took, place, uh, took effect on March 10th, 2023. The sign act is in Dropbox. Um, next is a National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, the Uniform Law Commission Study Committee on the Redaction of Personal Information from Public Records met on March 27, 2023, and is writing up its final report on whether or not to proceed to the next step, forming a committee to draft a uniform model act. Um, the next item is the recodification of the Federal Open Meeting Statute, Public Law 117-286 sections 3a and 7. The federal counterpart to the Open Meetings Act was modernized as part of a codification project by the U.S. House of Representatives. The Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, was repealed but replaced by the new Chapter 10 Federal Advisory Committees of Title V of the United States Code. Um, it was approved on December 27th, 2022. The new law provisions covers committees, boards, commissions, councils, conferences, panels, task forces, and similar groups established or utilized to obtain advice or recommendations for offices of the federal government. These federal bodies are required to provide public notice of their meetings, open their meetings to the public, barring permissible exceptions, and release minutes and transcripts. The codification bill is in Dropbox. Um, next is the Virginia Freedom of Information Act amendment regarding the posted, uh, posting of fee policy. As I have reported, the purpose of HB 2007 is to clarify Virginia's FOIA fee structure and abolish subjective fees and costs incurred by requesters. The governor signed the bill on March 26 and it will take effect on July 1st. The Enrolled Act is in Dropbox. OOG will continue to monitor all relevant legislation. Um, the last item in my report includes administrative matters. Um, first is the Vega 1030 15th Street Northwest relocation. The weekly meetings continue this month regarding Vega's relocation to its new office on March 8th, 15th, and April 5th. I, along with Chief of staff Mitchell and Director Cooks and administrative staff members met with the Department of General Services and Office of the Chief Technology Officer to discuss the progress of the agency's relocation to its new facility. Um, we seem to be on track to move in July and Director Cooks will provide more information about that in her report. Um, information Technology Specialist on March 17th, 2023, 
Vega posted an open full-time CS12 position for the information technology specialist. The position description and application are available on DCHR's website. Um, and the position description is also posted on open-dc.gov. The successful candidate will be responsible for, among other things, performing all development and maintenance of Vegas websites and online records. The vacancy announcement will be open for applications until April 16th, 2023. Newsletter, our paralegal specialist, Kimberly Brown, assisted by the entire staff, is preparing the next issue of the Open Govis newsletter, which we expect to publish on April 26, 2023. Um, and the last item is website redesign. As previously reported, Vega is redesigning its website, vega.dc.gov. I, along with Director Cooks and Senior Attorney Tran and Chief Counsel, Chief, um, I'm sorry, that should be Chief of Staff Mitchell, have been working on the project. Senior Attorney Tran is leading the implementation of the project since the departure of our IT, our IT specialist. The redesign team met on March 10th and March 30th. The project is in its final stages and moving towards completion, and we will be setting a firm launch date soon. This concludes the Office of Open Government's April 6, 2023 report. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director Allen. Uh, are there any other questions for Director Allen? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much. And we'll move to the next item on the agenda. And that's the report from the Office of Government Ethics. We'll hear now from um, Director Ashley Cooks. Director Cooks, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairperson Hutchison and members of the board. I'm Ashley Cooks, the Director of Government Ethics. I am pleased to present this report on the activities of the Office of Government Ethics, OGE. First is an update on the status of OGE operations. The information reported today regarding OGE's cases will not reflect any status changes that may occur as a result of actions taken by the board during today's meeting. First are open investigations by status. We have 49 matters that are open, two matters that are open pending negotiations, one matter open pending a show cause hearing for a grand total of 52 open investigations. For open undocumented matters, we have a grand total of four matters. Next are pending state negotiations by, excuse me, pending state investigations by status. We have 31 matters that are closed pending collection. Four matters stayed pending DC Superior Court case. Two matters stayed for OAG False Claims Act case. Four matters stayed for OIG investigation. And there are no matters stayed for U US District Court case for a grand total of 41 matters. For regulatory matters by status, we have 26 matters that are closed pending collection, five matters that are open for a grand total of 31 matters. Again, for open investigations, we have 52 matters and 10 matters that are stayed. The number of open preliminary and formal investigations includes 15 new matters. The investigative team has resolved 16 investigations since the board last met. The investigations team resolved 15 complaints that were dismissed for a lack of jurisdiction. Next is an update on trainings and outreach. First is professional de development trainings attended by staff. During the month of March, Attorney Advisor Maurice Eccles and General Counsel Rashi Raj took rulemaking 101 presented by the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. Chief of Staff Christina Mitchell completed How to Avoid Caving to Unreasonable Requests presented by E. Cornell University. Investigator Ileana Corrales took interview resistance training by Wicklander and Zulinski. Program Support Assistant Nikita Titus completed leadership training presented by the Department of Human Resources. On March 22nd through the 24th, Attorney Advisors Fran Van and Millicent Jones, Supervisory Attorney Asia Stewart Mitchell, General Counsel Rashi Raj, Senior Board Attorney Lynn Train and I attended the 18th Annual Conference for the Leadership Institute for Women of Color Attorneys. The two and a half day conference included engaging panel discussions such as law firm life from the perspective of high ranking women of color partners, steps to re strategize your career to land your dream job, salary negotiations, wealth building, retirement and legacy planning for attorneys and a spotlight on wellness. For trainings conducted by staff, 
since the March board meeting, OGE conducted four trainings, the monthly ethics training, the second of two trainings for the DC Office of Risk Management, the lobbyist e-filing training, and the March brown bag session. On last Monday, Attorney Advisor Millicent Jones presented the March Ethics Council Brown Bag Session on general principles under the District Personnel Manual Section 1800.3. Several Ethics Councils enjoy participating in scenarios provided by other Ethics Councils and attendants. A copy of the presentation was placed in the drop box for your review. This month marks one year since the launch of OGE's online learning management system, LMS. The LMS provides employees and public officials with on-demand ethics courses on topics such as financial, financial conflicts of interest, receiving gifts, becoming an ethical leader, ethical decision-making, post-employment restrictions, nepotism, financial conflicts of interest, excuse me, that should be financial disclosure statements, and many more critical ethics subjects. Thanks to outreach efforts by the training team, we were able to develop a relationship with the Metropolitan Police Department, MPD, to ensure that MPD employees receive ethics trainings on an annual basis through the LMS. Based upon a list of 4,088 employees provided by MPD, Program Coordinator Kozik initiated a bulk upload and campaign in which the LMS sent registration notices to those employees. He also provides weekly updates to of training completion to the high ranking to higher ranking MBA, MPD officials. In addition to uploading MPD's employees, we have uploaded 7,200 financial disclosure filers to the LMS. Per the ethics rules, filers are required to take ethics training on an annual basis. Since the last board meeting, 3,829 new users have registered for the system, which equals a total of 4,261 users. Additionally, during the month of March, 50 employees completed our online ethics training via PeopleSoft. Next is an update on outreach. Uh, OGE and OOG are finalizing the changes to the new Bega website in collaboration with the Office of the Chief Technology Officer's website development staff. We recently submitted final changes to the new website, and according to Octo, the website will be ready to launch next month. Next is an update on advisory opinions and advice. First, informal advice. OGE's legal staff provided advice for approximately 45 ethics inquiries, which is six more than the 39 presented at the last board meeting. This number does not include responses we have provided to questions regarding the lobbyist and FDS e-filing system. Next is formal advisory opinions. OGE has drafted formal advisory opinion guidance on the financial disclosure statement filing process. The opinion addresses the history and purpose of financial disclosure filings, who's required to file, including the designation process, how to file a financial disclosure statement, and the importance of reviewing financial disclosure statements to determine any apparent or potential conflicts of interest. Given that the 2023 filing system filing season has begun, this opinion will address some frequently asked questions and concerns. The draft has been posted to the BEGA website and will be sent to the DC Register for a 30-day comment period. A copy was placed in the Dropbox for your review. Next are legislation updates. First, um, an update on the 2022-23 budget oversight. On March 30th, 2023, Chairperson Hutchinson, Director Allen, and I provided testimony and information on the agency's spending and fiscal year 2024 budgetary needs before the Committee on, De on Executive Administration and Labor. Although the mayor has proposed to increase Vega's operating budget by $158,119 to reflect projected salary steps and fringe, cost, fringe benefit costs, the increase does not include any of the budget enhancement requests that the agency requested as essential to fulfilling its statutory obligations. I provided testimony concerning Vega's enhancement request for funding to hire a public information officer, legal fellow, and investigative staff to serve as a lobbyist task force to ensure compliance with the government's lobbying filing requirements. I also requested, I, I also provided testimony to request funding uh, to make necessary upgrades to the lobbyist registration and reporting e-filing system, which is the central database for 
lobbyist filings within the district government. The e-filing system currently allows lobbyists to terminate their registration without filing an activity report, does not distinguish between a lobbyist and a client, does not properly calculate late filing fees, and allows lobbyists to file activity reports without filing a prior report, etc. Additionally, I testified about Vegas enhancement requests for funding to increase the non-personnel services fund, which ensures the agency can continue to receive services under existing contracts and provide trainings to employees. A copy of my testimony and Vegas budget submission were placed in the Dropbox. Next is an update on the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Delinquent Debt Recovery Amendment Act of 2022. This act allows Vegas to, trans Vega to transfer delinquent debts associated with settlements and judgments for Ethics and Open Meeting Act violations to the district's central collection unit and for the funds collected on Vega's behalf to be deposited into the Ethics Fund or OMA Fund instead of the General Fund. The act became effective in December 2022. The additional funding will allow Vega to supplement its operations budget. OGE has begun discussions with the central collection units to send, up, to send an updated list of delinquent debts so that collections can be in. Next, I'll give an update on OGE administrative matters. First is OGE staffing. OGE plans to post announcements for its auditor, investigator, and attorney, vi attorney advisor vacancies this month. Next is an update on office relocation. Our office relocation is still underway. Uh, we continue to uh, attend our bi-weekly meetings with the Department of General Services and the project management team to discuss the build out of the space, furniture and finishes. Yesterday we met to, di to discuss details regarding signage, construction and technology. An update on the IT production provided by Octo will not delay our move-in date. The proposed move-in date still remains to be July 2023. Okay, next is an update on financial disclosure statement, FDS. The FDS 2023 season preparations are underway. The FDS team has determined which district employees will serve as agency ethics counselors. As stated at the, at the last board meeting, the FDS agency head memorandum, which provides details for employee designations and filings, was sent out at the beginning of February. A list of public filers and a cover letter have been sent to total office products for printing and envelope stuffing. Delivery is expected on April 10th. We are looking forward to the start of this year's filing season. We are predicting a slight increase in the number of filers this year. And I've included a chart which shows that we uh, anticipate a 9.3% increase in public filers and an 18% increase in confidential filers. Last on my list of updates is the Lobbyist Registration and Reporting, LRR. As mentioned earlier, the LRR team conducted a Lobbyist Reporting and Registration Training on March 22nd. Attorney Advisor Eccles and Program Coordinator Kosick met with 30 attendees to discuss the lobbyist laws and how to file registration and activity reports. The 2023 first quarter activity reports are due on April 18th, 2023. On March 29th, the LRR team contacted 538 registrants and clients to inform them of their 2023 quarter one activity reports, uh, which are due on, again, April 18th, um, as April 15th is a Saturday and April 17th is DC em Emancipation Day. Additionally, the LRR team sent nine letters to late um, activity report and registration filers to date one recipient responded by paying a $1,400 late fee. Also included in my notes is a chart which shows a slight decrease for uh, lobbyist registration reporting that there is it's a slight decrease in new registration reports, renewed registration reports, terminations, as well as um, activity reports, a slight decrease from last year. Thank you. This includes the Office of Government Ethics April 6, 2023 report. I welcome any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Director Cooks. Are there any questions for Director Cooks? Uh, I have one. Um, the So you predict a, what well, looks like almost a 30% increase in filers, uh, whether they're confidential or public filers. I mean, obviously the district government's employee base hasn't increased by 
thirty percent. So are these people that were finally ferreting out with the help of their agency counsel um, to get them to file when in the past they probably should have? That's one of the reasons, as well as um, salary increases within the district government. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Next on the agenda are um, public comments. The public was invited to submit comments in writing by 11 a.m. today, and the board received one public comment from Gottlieb Simon. Mr. Simon asked the board to determine the specific actions taken by OGE to collect outstanding debts against two former ANC commissioners, A. Muhammad in case number 20-0023-P and J. Johnson in case number 200011-P and to assess OGE's efforts to collect debts from closed matters pending collection. The comment will be included in the record for this meeting. Okay, I don't think we have any further information on that right now. So we'll um, get back to um, address the comment when we have more information. Okay. Madam Chair, um, this is uh, Chip Nottingham. I, that's just, I guess mm -hmm. that's the question. You've anticipated my question, which is, I mm -hmm. found the um, I found the comment to be particularly articulate, well, well, well communicated from Mr. Simon, who. I don't believe I've ever had the uh, opportunity to meet, so I just, but I was, it, it was uh, well written and um, it struck a note with me, I'll say, just because I do think it does go to the core of, of uh, Vega's authority and our credibility um, that, that, that our judgments actually get enforced or can be enforced. So uh, I look forward, I guess I, I look forward at the earliest reasonable opportunity, like by the next meeting, to hear a report on, on how. Um, our agency is is responding to uh, to Mr. Simon. Okay, and those two in particular, and the um, collection efforts in general. And I guess I would just add that it it rings a bell because I think we heard at last month's meeting about another case involving um, Michael Redmond. Uh, we had adjudicated a penalty uh, a year or two ago that we heard last month, and I look forward to hearing at the appropriate time this meeting or. New business, what the status of that uh, judgment is. I guess it was reported last week to us that Mr. Redmond was late in uh, in paying, and there was some question as to whether he was even um, findable or he was. Uh, um, so this this touches on that same issue. And so I, I look forward to hearing more about the Redmond case as well. Thanks. Okay. All right, Chair Chairperson Hutchison, I can give some update about. Uh, particularly the two matters that were referenced in the public comment. Okay. So those two matters were sent over to the Central Collection Unit um, back in 2020. Uh, we had not heard anything. I, I assume it was due to the pandemic from the Central Collection Unit about those two matters in particular, um, but they have been, they have collected fines for us um, that were related to other matters. Uh, so we have sent those two matters back to the CCU to ensure that they start collection actions. And that was actually done on March 17th. Um, General Counsel Raj followed up with the CCU on March 23rd to find out if they had actually taken any action or referred the matter to the collections agency, which the CCU uses uh, to, to collect debts. Um, we have not heard from the CCU yet, but General Counsel Raj plans to reach out to them again today. Uh, we do plan to send an updated list of our delinquent debt to the CCU so that they can start collection action for us. Uh, Mr. Redman will be included in that new spreadsheet. So we're hopeful that um, CCU will collect on our matter, uh, on all our delinquent matters. And I will say that that is one of the reasons why we have we asked the council to issue the Delinquent Debt Amendment Act um, is because the CCU was not, they were collecting on our behalf, but that money was going into the general fund. Um, and we are really stressing the point that the money should come to Vega that's collected. Uh, but we have taken actions to engage with the CCU, um, to send them up, we're, we're gonna send them updated 
a list of debt to get that to get those funds collected because we want to hold those people accountable as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nottingham, do you need any further information or that's as much as we have right now? I'm thinking. No, that's that's pretty responsive. Thanks. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, our agency's on record communicating not only with if it's the um, CCA, but also you know, whether it's OGE, whether it's the Attorney General's office, just it's, there seems to be a little bit of, um, I don't know, finger pointing like, you know, other some other office is supposed to be doing something, but anything we can do to corral everybody so we can be working in the same direction. I know the council and the mayor are dealing with some major budget, you know, issues this time of year. And, and uh, as we all, you know, all, all of us taxpayers are looking at the world and, and the, uh, the, it's just uh, the, the idea that there's this uncollected money owed the district is it's frustrating. And um, I just hope we're making, everyone's making their best efforts, but I appreciate that update. Thanks. Thank you, Director Cooks. Um, just to be clear, are, are there any other options available to us or is that the process that's in place, at least as to these three matters? There are other options available. Another option is to um, have OAG to file a petition in Superior Court um, to seek a judgment on our behalf, but that judgment still has to be collected upon. Um, and also we can, which we have done when we had our auditor uh, taking some collection actions as far as sending letters to respondents. But uh, those are the three, the CCU uh, getting a, a judgment in Superior Court or just sending notice on our own. Okay. Okay. So what's involved in the, if I may ask the OAG Process. I mean, does that tend to come back pretty quickly or does it help at all? Or That depends on the court. So, uh, the okay. court, uh, we have language in our negotiated dispositions, which allow us that that comes directly from the ethics act, which allows us to transfer these matters or to refer them to OAG, uh, to petition superior court, but it just depends on how fast superior court moves to give us uh, those judgments. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for director cooks? I know I I'm pleased to hear that. 1 of our options is sending a letter to the respondents. I realized that 1 of the problems here is these respondents often change addresses and are hard to locate. So I, I recognize that the letter itself. May be somewhat symbolic, but. I welcome to hear my colleagues thoughts on this, but seems to me to make sense that we would send those letters almost just as automatically as a matter of course, um, uh, just to prevent some respond from saying, well, gee, I haven't heard anything recently from Vega. They don't seem to be that concerned about this. And I don't know, is there a downside or a major cost to, to try to try to send letters to each of the people we've, uh, we've assigned uh, fines to um, if, if the, date, the due date comes and goes and there's no payment. Um, I like the idea of going on record, I guess, uh, that we've, we've done everything we can. I, I would just add, I don't think there's a downside to sending reminder letters or even, you know, sternly <laughs> remindful letters. We did something like this at the, uh, uh, at the DC bar for, um, attorneys who had been disbarred and yet owed restitution to their clients. Uh, that they had wronged, um, and even though they had been disbarred, and it was years later in some cases, and it was questionable about about whether or not they could even afford to pay the restitution fine, we did it anyway and uh, sent letters out, and it resulted in a uh, check received for over sixty five thousand dollars by one of the uh, former respondents who had been disbarred. So, you never know. You never know. One letter, you know, got a sixty five thousand dollars. So. It can happen. Okay. All right. If there are no further questions on that matter, the next item on the agenda is executive session. This is an executive session to discuss ongoing confidential investigations pursuant to DC official code section 2-575 B14 
to consult with an attorney to obtain legal advice and to preserve the attorney client privilege between an attorney and a public body pursuant to DC official code section 2-575 B4A to discuss personnel matters, including the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, performance evaluation, compensation, discipline, demotion, removal or resignation of government appointees, employees or officials pursuant to DC official code section 2-575 B10 to deliberate on a decision in which the ethics board will exercise quasi judicial functions pursuant to DC official code section 2-575 B13 and to discuss contract negotiation strategies pursuant to DC official code section 2-575 B2. May I have a motion to enter into executive session? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Great, it's been moved and seconded that the board enter into executive session. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Board members, please log out of this session and log into the WebEx for the executive session. And once the executive session is completed, we will return to, the, um, to this WebEx to report out any matters decided and to finish up any other business and adjourn the meeting. Thank you.
We're waiting for our chair. Are we sure she's not in the uh, attendees room like I sometimes am? Maybe no, I don't camera. see her there. Act it up again. Yeah, she's not there. Nope. Maybe the camera issue has been exacerbated. Lynn, what's a quorum again? Is it three? It is three. Hmm. Well, if she is having technical difficulties and she can't get back on, we could always uh, proceed to just report out. Because really, all we are, we've already done everything that a quorum needs to do. We just need to report out what we did. Yeah, I think we we have a quorum uh, to um, to adopt whatever um, decision we need to uh, close out the meeting with and then also to adjourn. But, but those are both um, actions that are, I think we can, uh, a quorum can go okay. forward and. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Excellent. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, I'm here. Um, it, the time is now 2.06 p.m. and we are reconvening. Um, to report out that the board approved a negotiated disposition in the matter 2223-0010-P in Ray K. Woodlow. Um, and that was the only thing to put report out. So this concludes the meeting at 2.07 p.m. Um, the next meeting will take place also via WebEx on May 4th, 2023 at noon. And um, as I ended the board meeting, uh, happy whatever it is you celebrate this week or this weekend, and we will see you at the May meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.